what's your story? You ask me, I ask you, what's your story? Because telling our stories helps explain ourselves to each other. What's your story? If a Christian asks that of another Christian, the answer probably is going to be my story is the story of the Bible or the story of Jesus Christ through the ages or something of that sort. And that would certainly be the answer that holds together the Christian story. But there's more to it than that. Jesus may be a living presence to the believing Christian of today, but a lot has happened between then and now. The Christian church existed through the ages, and I'd like to see whether I could change the concept somewhat by saying, what's your story? And you answer, uh, my story is partly medieval, the Middle Ages. And as I hear that, I can also picture somebody saying, ah, now we got to where I live. I live mentally in the age of the cathedrals. I live in the age of the high sacraments. I love the Middle Ages. But I can hear just as many other people saying, what, my story is medieval? The Middle Ages? Never. For me, the Middle Ages are the Dark Ages. For me, the Middle Ages represents the thousand years that the Protestant reformers swept away when they cleared the cathedrals of images and painted them to their own liking inside and elevated the pulpit and made that important for the act of preaching. I don't want all the superstitions and the relics and the magic and all that went with the Middle Ages. Never for me. Well, just think of the environment in which we are again. This is on the campus of the University of Chicago, started at the end of the 19th century as a place that was to be modern, modernizing, modernistic, liberal, up to date. And what did they do when they wanted to suggest that they were intellectually serious or when they wanted to point to the sacred because they believed in that, they reached to the Middle Ages to a form of architecture that dominated in much of Europe in the Middle Ages, the Gothic. Now, a lot has changed. By the time the Protestant modernists who built this campus built Rockefeller Chapel in the 1920s. Behind me, for example, is a bishop's chair. I doubt whether a bishop ever sat in it. There are niches in the reredos, the technical term for the great backdrop to the altar. Uh, if you look closely, you find that they're all empty. There should be saints all over there, but not to the Protestant modernists. Still, they couldn't get the Gothic arches out of their way. They couldn't get the sense of the height of it out of their way. We carry medieval images all the time. Just for fun, I wore a tie today that has a fleur de lis on it, the uh, lily of the valley in a stylized form that represents the Blessed Virgin Mary. A lot of Protestants don't use that language, and yet I could be in your home and very likely see on silverware or on the wall images of this sort. We carry them around with us all the time. Right down into the 1950s and maybe even today when people built churches, suburban Protestants would often say, I want a church that looks like a church. And they would reach into the medieval period, the Catholic Middle Ages, the time of Christendom. So if I say that you are in part a bearer of a medieval story, we know we're going to be selective about it. And I'm not going to take for granted that anybody takes the Middle Ages as a package deal. But we want to reach into the Middle Ages and draw from that a number of other themes that are part of our story today. What's your story? If it's a Christian story, I'm going to say next, your story is an Augustinian story named after Augustine. Some people think the greatest Christian in at least a thousand years. Augustine? Why should we care about somebody after Bible times? I think we do that because when we tell stories, people are always in them. If I'm to tell the story of Christianity in our time, I'm going to talk about Billy Graham and Pope John the 23rd or Pope John Paul the second or Mother Teresa or Dorothy Day or Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If you know any of those names, you know how they shape us. And Augustine was a great shaper. Exactly how? How did this fourth century figure shape you and me? If you've read any autobiography in our time, Born Again in its title, or if it's about a conversion, it's as much influenced by Augustine as it is by the conversion of Paul. Maybe more so, because that first great autobiography, which he called The Confessions, tells about a wayward youth. He had a mistress, 
He had a child outside of marriage. He loved them. He left them along the way in this conversion period, and we don't hear much about them along the way. He had a mother, Monica, Saint Monica, as in Santa Monica, who prayed for his conversion. And somewhere along the way, after long conditioning, after profound learning, he one day heard the voice as of a child saying, tole lege, take and read. And there on a bench in the garden was the book of Paul to the Romans opened and he read the passage and he was changed by it and eventually went through all the processes of becoming a bishop. He could have sat in the chair behind us, but he didn't have a cathedral like this. He had a little dumpy outpost, Hippo, in North Africa. Not a very prestigious place to be, but he made a lot of it. He always said that the Christian people deserve the best, so he gave them the best of his mind and of his intellect. He not only influenced our concept of what it is to be born again or converted or changed, he also wrote a great book called The City of God. Some people call it the Charter of Christendom because it really was the model by which Christians lived for a thousand years. He talked about the heavenly city and the earthly city. He didn't separate church and state the way we do today, but in a way he was prefiguring that too. He talked about a concept that most Christians still use, whether they use the word or not, the concept of original sin, something that is just our inheritance by being children of Adam, by being human. And he talked so much about grace, God's grace, that when the reformers, let's take the example of Martin Luther, who was an Augustinian monk, a student of Augustine in a monastic order named after him, when Martin Luther took things up, he was influenced, too, by that concept of God's grace. God is not just a tyrant or a terror, as some people in the Middle Ages believed, but God overwhelms us with goodness and with grace, and Augustine talked about that. Maybe his most famous line is something that lives on in you if you're Augustinian. He said to God, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. So if you're somebody of a restless heart, and who in the 20th century isn't, and you're looking for repose and rest in God, you probably took lessons from St. Augustine without even knowing it. What's your story, if it's a Christian story? I don't think I have a hard time making the case that it's a medieval story, but I probably would have a good deal more difficulty saying it's a papal story, namely having to do with the Pope. Half of Christendom, maybe more than half of Christendom today, is Roman Catholic in obedience to the Pope. But uh, non-Catholic, namely Eastern Orthodox and Protestant Christianity, is often anti-papal. Still, it's not hard to show the ways in which all of us are influenced by the medieval papacy and the way the popes of those times helped make up our story. Augustine, let's remember, had divided the earthly city from the heavenly city. And the Pope saw himself as the representative of the heavenly city. Indeed, officially came known to be the vicar of Christ, the representative of Christ on earth, claiming to be in a direct succession all the way back to Peter, one of the apostles. Meanwhile, the emperor, for a very long time, it was called the Holy Roman Empire. It included Spain, it included what is today's Germany, the Holy Roman Empire, Western Europe, had an emperor, and while the Pope and the emperor were supposed to complement each other, human nature being what it was, they both vied to be the supreme authority. In the modern world, the state, the government, the constitution determines things, and in a sense, the church may lead a free life, but it is uh, independent. In the Middle Ages, some of the popes worked very hard to be sure that they were the top authority along the way. So much so that in the year 1077, Pope Gregory VII, one of the greatest and best popes of the Middle Ages, was out to humiliate Henry IV, who was the Holy Roman Empire. The pope had enormous power. He could say, no one in your realm can be baptized, can go to mass, if you are disobedient to me. And that was a terrible pressure because if you weren't baptized and couldn't go to mass and couldn't have your sins forgiven, you'd go to limbo or purgatory or hell. And so the Pope and the emperor would come to a jarring like this and 
the emperor had to repent. The pope humiliated him by having him stand in the snow for three days at Canossa. And then the pope was sort of forced to forgive him after that act of humiliation. But they kept fighting for power all along the way. Innocent III was one of the great theorists of the power of the papacy. He argued that just as in the Bible it was said that the greater light, the sun, was made to rule by day, and the lesser light, the moon, by night, and the moon drew its light from the sun, so the papacy was really the representative of the sun, the power of God in the world, and the emperor was to take power from that. The pope had armies. He could uh, see, in a sense, who should be king of England or king of France or whose army should fight whom. Obviously, open to a great deal of corruption along the way. And yet the popes also helped to stimulate learning. They helped to build the cathedrals. They often endorsed the orders of monks that were part of reform in the church. Some of them did lead very holy lives. But throughout, what they did succeed in doing was suggesting that the heavenly realm, the eternal city, the power of God, also was ruled on earth. And to this day, there are realms in the Christian church where people dream of if only we had the power to determine the laws of the land and so on. So there's a little bit of that sneaked into a lot of people who never were obedient to the Pope. A moment ago I said that in the Middle Ages the Pope had enormous power even over emperors because he controlled the sacraments. That meant he in a sense said I have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I can let people into heaven and I can keep people out in purgatory or hell all by the control of the sacraments. Now, I want to leap from there and say, uh, what's the big deal with the sacraments in the Middle Ages? In what way are they part of your story? Well, in some ways, of course, the sacrament of baptism, observed by almost all Christians, Quakers and a couple of other groups don't observe it. It goes back to New Testament times. Go and baptize is a word in the Gospels. And the Lord's Supper, where Jesus has people taking the bread and the wine as his body and blood is commanded in the New Testament. So those two at least were always there, but they developed greatly in the Middle Ages along with some other sacraments in the Catholic catalog, though again, Protestants don't observe any more than those two. Baptism got to be very important because if you weren't baptized, you would go to limbo or purgatory. So midwives were taught to baptize instantly if there was any danger of a child's death. And there were great numbers of children's deaths. But it was really the Lord's Supper which had become the Eucharist, Thanksgiving, or especially the Mass, which was the great key to the kingdom and great power. And theories developed along with that along the way. The New Testament doesn't make very clear what it means when you talk about body and blood and bread and wine. So in the Middle Ages, they attached philosophy to it and came up with a teaching maybe the longest word I'll use today, transubstantiation. That is that the substance of the communion was really the body and blood of Jesus and the bread and the wine after the priest's blessing was only the outer form, the accidental feature of it. And again, if you had to have the sacrament to get into heaven, you could see how powerful that was. Well, today's Catholicism doesn't use the sacrament that way and non-Catholics never did, but the accent on the sacraments was very much a development of the Middle Ages. If I were to suggest that the Middle Ages, medieval times, are part of your story, I truly hate to end with that dark and shadowy side of Crusades and Inquisition. There's a brighter spot. I would call that the councils. We still have church councils, congregational, Presbyterian, Episcopal, Catholic bodies all have councils. Some of them in Catholicism have bishops forming the council, but it can be lay councils too in Catholic parishes. They're very democratic kinds of things today. They weren't quite so much in the Middle Ages, but the council was a very important instrument in part for the Pope to carry out his teaching and in part as a check against papal power because now you had bishops from all over determining how doctrine would develop how the sacraments would be administered, and so on. And so there's some competition developing between the Pope and the Council. Sometimes the Councils claimed that they could not err, just as the Pope could not err. And that became a big argument in the Reformation of the Church.
But I think we shouldn't leave the Middle Ages or our story of the Middle Ages without seeing the churning that goes on, the reform that goes on already in that period with the councils. And when I speak about churning, I guess I'm back to a theme that we talked about when we had Augustine on stage, and that is that the church in all the ages is not only a place for solace and comfort and serenity, but a place that points to it for the restless heart and the restless church along the way. If the Christian story of the Middle Ages is yours somehow, you may not at all like some of the things you've heard about and seen. The splendor of the cathedral, the pomp and power of the papacy, all the glories and all the gold. There's another side, and that may speak more clearly to your heart. Your story may be a search for simplicity, and the Middle Ages have given us some of the best models there have ever been. St. Francis of Assisi, perhaps the best known, is somebody who was known very much for his love of nature. In fact, outside this chapel, there's a pulpit. We call it the St. Francis pulpit, and the student legend is that it was done there because Francis preached to the birds. Whether or not that's the case, it was a symbol of the fact that he left behind him the cathedral. He left behind him his own father's uh, business. Uh, his father was a wealthy merchant. He went barefoot and chose a simple life and gathered other people like him. You're probably Franciscan if you've ever said a prayer, whether he wrote it or not, in his spirit. It's called the prayer of St. Francis. Oh Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. And a person of peace. He was in a long tradition of monasticism. Men and women who'd gone out to the desert, who went to caves, who formed community, in search of the simple life. But that may not be your search either. You may be on a spiritual search. Many late 20th century people define themselves that way. Go to a large bookstore today and you're likely to see a section called spirituality. Some of it is Buddhist, some Hindu, some New Age, but a lot of it draws upon biblical and Christian and particularly medieval sources. This university where I taught for decades has more students, not only women, writing dissertations on medieval women mystics than on any modern people. You'll hear names like Hildegard of Bingen and Julianne of Norwich and Marjorie Kemp in the halls of this place. People who are not trying to be antiquarians and museum keepers, but modern men and women who are trying to find union with God and depth in their Christian faith draw upon this. So if you're a meditator, you're likely to be drawing very much on the story of the Middle Ages. And there's one more and we dare not forget that on a university campus. And that's the search for the intellectual life. The modern university, with its classic cathedral, its Gothic forms, its bells that sound as if you're at Oxford in the 13th century, fit in very well with Oxford in the 13th century. We are indeed direct heirs of it. Oxford, Cambridge, Paris, Bologna were founded by people who believe that you should love the Lord not only with your heart and your soul, but also with your mind. They thought Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, the greatest of them, that you could more or less prove the existence of God and prove the truth of Scripture and prove the truth of the Christian faith. But they were always humble enough to know that you needed heart and soul along with mind. Moderns like C.S. Lewis and others who are apologists, explainers of the Christian faith are very much in that same tradition. And so I'd have to say at the end of your tour of the Middle Ages, if you are on a simplicity search, a spiritual search, or an intellectual search, some part of that story you got from the Middle Ages, whether you like them or not. And I think you'll begin to like much about the Middle Ages. They are part of your story. your story. It's a story of reform, I'm sure, and if it's a Christian story, it certainly includes the element of reforming. We all know what reforming means. If I tell you my story, you tell me yours, we'll soon get into the plot of reforming. Take me, for example. I will regularly reform by saying, I will not drink any more caffeinated drinks. And that lasts for a day or two, and then I'm back to caffeinated drinks and need some other kind of reform. Or uh, 
you might make New Year's resolutions on December 31. You are going to reform. And some of those resolutions will last as long as January 2 or 3, and then you have to reform again. I'm certainly not making fun of the impulse to reform, the need to reform, and the act of reforming. In the process, we do grow into something better than what we had been along the way. I'm only saying that it's very hard to think in terms of reform. We do it too in our institutional, our social, and our cultural life, everything we belong to. Nations are always in the business of reforming, or the political powers and parties that fight for their place in the nation. They will regularly say, we're out for reform. One of them even calls itself a reform party. And if you're in uh, corporate life and you have a new CEO, when she comes in, he comes in, they want to make a new mark, and they know there's something wrong. That's why they're brought in, and so they must reform. They will reform, and you'd better get ready to be a participant in reform, no matter how set in your ways you've been, however comfortable you've been about your unreformed life. Some individuals took on reform. One of the better known ones was a monk named Savonarola in Florence, Italy, a city full of images and paintings and so on to represent the Christ story. But Savonarola saw a lot of trade in these images, and he thought people were worshiping them instead of God, so he started burning the images, and they even the score by burning him. Another one in uh, Czechoslovakia, we would call it today, the Czech Republic, was uh, John Hus, who said the lay people should no longer be denied the wine and the cup, the blood of Christ, along with the bread, the body, as they had been denied. And he said, we can only go with the teachings that are clearly in the Bible, nowhere else. And he was promised safe conduct to a council at Constance, which was going to see whether any of his teaching was true or whether all of it was false. Safe conduct, they said, but it was a one-way ticket. They burned him, too, along the way. In England, John Wycliffe, a Bible translator, and groups called the Lollards also had their troubles, and many died. In all of those circumstances, we began to see a chafing, an itching for reform on a larger scale. Reform really became necessary when one practice started reaching Germany, a place that was already resentful of the Pope and papal action and money being drained from Germany across the Alps to pay for St. Peter's Church in Rome. How do you pay for it? How do you pay for all these expenses? Well, some people discovered that one way to do it is to buy your way out of purgatory. Purgatory was that place this side of hell, this side of heaven, where you'd be purged of your sins and given a new start. And a Dominican monk named John Tetzel started making his way around Germany, selling indulgences. You give him money, he'll get you out of purgatory at once or at least a lot sooner. And if you were resentful already, now you were really resentful having to fork over and pay and buy your way into a better future. Reform was all ready to be broken out and indeed, in response to John Tetzel, an incident occurred from which many people date the Protestant Reformation. What's your story? If it's a story born of the Protestant Reformation, it's a story of grace. You're not the only one to have it. Catholics talk grace, too. But the big fight in the 16th century between John Tetzel and those who opposed him was over grace. And among his opposers, his opponents, was the best known Martin Luther, an Augustinian monk who, out of the travail of his own soul, started asking questions that brought him to a confrontation with Tetzel and the sellers of indulgences. You see, in the monastery, Luther, an anguished young person, took so seriously the presence of God, a God who judges, who he saw to be angry and uh, tyrannical, and arbitrary. He always asked himself, as he thought of that God, how can I be sure of God's grace? How can I be sure that I'm in God's favor? Can I do so by my being sorry for my sins? Can I do it by, by trying to do good works? Can I buy my way? And he was convinced, no, he couldn't. He was a professor of the Old Testament at a backwater university called Wittenberg, and he started reading and teaching the Psalms. And then he went into the New Testament and started uh, teaching and reading the letter of Paul to the Romans, always with his own zeal in mind to find his way to God. And he was convinced that that way was free of charge, that God, through Jesus Christ, had taken care of everything for us, and all we needed was faith 
his key word was justification. You are made just by grace through faith. That was it. No indulgences to be paid. No works to be done. So far, so good, except he was running into a church that didn't uh, want that taught. It had an elaborate system of merit and work, and grace was disruptive of that. Grace was there, but it was a submerged theme. So what do you do in those circumstances? You start debates. You have debates between these squabbling monks in these German monasteries. You send delegates up from Rome, because this is very disturbing in Rome. You're counting on German money to cross the Alps to help pay for St. Peter's. That's going to be cut off, because the German princes very much like to be independent of that financial system. They started, many of them, backing Luther and his colleagues. Luther started preaching this message beyond the university and sending out students to preach it. But as much as they believed in the preached word, the word had to be shouted and not just written in German. Geschrien and not just geschrieben. You can hear the pun. If Martin Luther and his colleagues had to do all their disseminating just with their own quill pens, they'd get no further than my writing would with my pad here in front of me on this day. But it happened that shortly before this reform began, John Gutenberg and his colleagues had invented movable type, and thus the printing press. It's hard to imagine what a difference that was to make in the lives of ordinary people in Europe, just at the time of this dissent and disruption in the religious fabric of Europe. People were hungry for what could come forth. And Martin Luther scribbled a good deal. What did he scribble most of all? He was proudest of the fact that he translated the Bible. In England, they'd been translating the Bible into English so that the lay people could do their own judging. But now it's happening all over the continent. Luther was spirited off by some friends after he was kicked out of, excommunicated from the Catholic Church. He was spirited away to a desk no bigger than this in a little room in the Wartburg Castle. And in a matter of weeks, he came up with a New Testament translation. And in a matter of weeks, it was being spread all over Germany and over the rest of Europe. Every day, he was writing, stormy preacher, running around and still sitting at that desk, publishing every 14 days of the next 30 years about a 30-page document that makes up 100 volumes today. And all of it about that single theme in its own way, clearing the path for God's grace and that you were to be made just through it. I certainly would give the wrong impression if I suggested that the Catholic Church that he stood up against did not itself reform. Some parts of that reform took a long time. Some began instantly. But what is interesting to me is how the two main battles that went on, making the Bible available to ordinary people and preaching the message of God's love and grace, got widespread in Catholicism too. I started seeing this as someone who was at the Second Vatican Council, in my case in 1964, and seeing how much influence the Bible, the scriptures, had on the bishops and the learned people there, and how eager they were to get the new translations, the French of the Jerusalem Bible, and new English translations into the hands of the people so they could judge for themselves. That's reform. And as far as the battle over grace is concerned, in 1999, official Catholicism and the Lutheran World Federation, after working for years in a common document, signed a document on their agreements on what being justified by grace through faith means today. So that part of the war is over. But we have a story to tell first of the spread of reform far beyond Luther and Germany into all of Europe and from there into much of the world. What's your story? It's a story of diversity if you've been influenced by the Protestant Reformation. For that matter, there was the Catholic Reformation which brought diversity already in its own time. But if you want a long list of how much diversity there is in Protestantism, you would get a book of 50 years ago written by any Catholic historian who would have just register after register of every little tiny group. The idea being that the Middle Ages had been a simple unity gathered around the Pope and around the church. And then along came Luther and Calvin and Swingley and Knox and Henry VIII and all these other people we're going to talk about in just a moment who uh, disrupted that unity. And once you have diversity, you're going to have chaos. That was pretty clear in their mind. And that uh, resulted in part from some of the main Protestant motifs. 
the fact that you did your own interpreting of the Bible or were free to. Here I stand, said Luther, unless I'm convinced by sound reason and the scripture. I can't recant. I can't change. Whether he said it in exactly those words or not, he did stand up to the emperor along the way. And once you've done that, you've started a new principle in operation. So individual freedom, the freedom of the churches, the freedom of conscience, the freedom to set up your own shop in the church, for that matter. To get the sense of the spread of reform and the reasons for its diversity, the best way to do it is to get out our compass for a moment and take a quick scan of Europe. Let's start north by northwest, the British Isles. Time to cross the channel. A very different pattern of reformation. Again, a conservative reformation in that it was to keep everything it could out of medieval Catholic Christianity. But there were some big reasons for abrasion. In the British case, in the English case, there was no particular theologian, no particular prophet, no particular thinker who was in charge. There'd been all this churning of the Bible translators and a lot of active lay people, but the person in charge here happened to be the king. In a story too familiar to retell, it's the story of Henry VIII, who wanted to divorce one of his wives, and the pope didn't want to give in on that divorce, and therefore the king of England declared himself independent of the papacy. Keep all the rest, but you can't have the papacy. Interestingly, Henry VIII came to be called the Defensor Fidei, the Defender of the Faith. And all the way down to modern monarchs, Queen Elizabeth II, they get named the Defender of the Faith, whether they spend much time on it or not. Remember the principle of cuius regio, eus religio. When Henry VIII was in power, the church was what we today call Anglican or Episcopal. And so with Queen Elizabeth, whereas with Queen Mary, it reverted to Catholicism. It was back and forth in that pattern of Reformation. And it was to spawn its own descent later in the forms we call Puritanism. The main reformer in Scotland, meanwhile, was a man named John Knox, influenced by the Continental Reformation, and in many ways, the father of Scottish Presbyterianism and thus of the Presbyterianism that people in the United States know and many adhere to. In Northeast Europe, Scandinavia, the Reformation was uh, all at once, pretty much, in the terms of Lutheranism, as the various kings were striking their own patterns toward nationalism. Their scholars had studied in Wittenberg and in the German universities, and they brought the Lutheran Reformation there. So to this day, Iceland, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, the Scandinavian nations are, at least in name and in culture, Lutheran as opposed to some other form of Protestantism. Eastern Europe, Poland, the Czech, the Slovak areas, there was not as much Protestantization, but some did occur along the way. The real drama is uh, Southwest. That Southwest drama is uh, Switzerland, parts of France, parts of Southwest Germany, what we call Reformed Protestantism. This is almost concurrent with the Lutheran Reformation, but it's under a very different influence now, particularly two people, but most of all one of them, John Calvin. John Calvin was a French lawyer who made his way to Geneva and uh, organized the reform there. Very much focused on the Bible and on grace, although he had a somewhat different initial impetus. Whereas Martin Luther and some of the others started with the grace of God and then backed up to say, but remember the God we're talking about is sovereign, is in control, is majestic. For Calvin, it was the other way around. What are we going to do in the face of a God who is sovereign and in control and majestic? So Calvin started talking about the way that God elected people to salvation and to damnation. It brought a whole new twist into it. There's as much grace in Calvinism as there is in the rest of Protestantism, but it starts always with that giving glory to the God who rules the nations and rules the heart. And Calvin is very important because he influenced the Presbyterians, he influenced the Puritans, he influenced most of the Protestants that came also through Anglicanism to Virginia, to New England, and set up shop. Because setting up shop is what Calvin did. In Geneva, he really did what the Catholics had done. He said, there's going to be one religion here, 
It doesn't have to be run by the Pope and cardinals. It's going to be run by elders. It's going to be run by lay people, but it's going to be run. There were many laws set up in the name of the church. We were against dissenters. In fact, one dissenter, a man named Servetus, was put to death as a result of Calvin's preaching and alliance with civil authorities. He was a heretic. He was an outsider. But Calvin is most remembered for a very positive thing. He was the most systematic intellectual in early Protestantism and left his stamp on it all. I always like to think of him as sort of the Protestant Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas had brought a summa, a summary system, an order to the Christian faith in his Catholic version. And that's what John Calvin did through a great book called The Institutes of the Christian Religion, a book reprinted and read in our own time, far more orderly and systematic than any of the writings of Luther, who was a kind of a stormy sort. And then there was Zwingli, Huldreich Zwingli, a Swiss who dies young. He was killed in battle in one of the wars that's churned up in Swiss nationalism and in the Reformation. But in his short years, had a great deal of impact, again, on many parallel tracks to Calvin and Luther. But uh, he began to innovate on another line that leads me to call him the first modern Protestant. Luther was really a thoroughly medieval person in the way he looked at reality. And thus, for Luther, the bread and the wine of the communion really made Christ present. His body and blood was a real presence for Luther. In fact, he is said to have put on the table in front of him in debates with Swingley, hoc est, this is my body and blood, is, is, is for Luther. Behind the realities we see is another kind of reality. Swingley, on the other hand, said, no, the bread and the wine represent the body and blood. What matters is the command of Christ. He said, do this. What matters is the memory of Christ. Do it in memory of me. What matters is the examination of your heart and the faith you bring. And from then until now, for many people in the modern world, the reality we see is, like, say, opaque instead of transparent as it had been for medieval people. You can't see through it the way medieval people would, in effect, see through the body and the blood. So Luther and Calvin and then Zwingli, further over, had their arguments over the Lord's Supper. And in 1529, Luther said to Zwingli, you have a different spirit. And in that bitterness, helped contribute to the splitting up and the diversity of the Protestant Reformation. Well, on almost every side of every hill, I could find you another reformer. But uh, we're going to have to leave them just to remind ourselves that there was also reform in Catholicism. A lot of Catholic historians would say, we didn't need all these people up there in the northern part of Europe. We had reform going already in Spain and reform going in Italy. Reform in the form of new orders like the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus, who were ready to go out into the whole world. A reform of life, a reform of morals, a reform of teaching, a reform of worship. So that, too, is thrown into the mix of diversity. But one thing was not yet as diverse as Protestants' itch or impulse would make it be, and that is how to govern. What's your story? It's probably also a story of dissent. Catholics today are free to dissent with other Catholics, as seldom before, since Vatican II. Protestantism was born as a movement of dissent against Catholicism. And Protestantism spawned dissenting movements more radical than those we've talked about. We've talked about Protestants who kept the Lord's Supper more or less as it had been, and baptism of infants as it had been. And now came some people who said, you must only baptize believers who can speak for themselves. Anna Baptist, we will re-baptize them. Some of them didn't baptize even at all. Today they live on as Anna Baptist, Mennonite, Church of the Brethren, Quaker, or whatever, they remained small, but their voice became very large. Curiously, the same Protestants who had been persecuted by Catholics when they ran the territories themselves persecuted these dissenters. There was no room for them in their Europe. And it took a long time for the power of dissent to make its voice heard. I remember sitting in this very church in the 1950s when my own favorite theologian, H. Richard Niebuhr, was talking about what had happened to Protestantism. And he used the design of a building like this as a symbol of it. He said, in medieval Catholicism, there was one focus, the altar. Even the pulpit didn't count. There were no other rooms for education or the laity. 
Today you could visit a cathedral in Europe and you can't find a restroom inside it. And here you have a kind of a sprawl all over the place of places for education, for service, for outreach, for United Protestant ministry on the campus or for whatever. And uh, there's still a cross, a very different kind of cross than in the Middle Ages, but the altar is not as prominent. The coming together of people is a big part of it. And if I went to an evangelical church, it would have different appointments. If I went to a high church Episcopal or a Lutheran or a Presbyterian church, they'd be more formal. Chaos, some people would say, but I also want to call it energy because good things have come out of it along the way. And while we seek coherence, the Christian unity movements are trying to find coherence and intercommunion in Christ. We also have to say that out of this dissent that has been persecuted and been so troublesome and often outvoted has come an energy that enlivens the Christian story today. And whenever you are disturbed by dissent or if you are a dissenter, realize that you're contributing to the energy that makes up the adventure of an enlarged Christian story. A story which if you're a Christian, is your story. What's your story? If you'd ask me that, I'd have to say my story as a Christian involves this street, this place. I happen to be walking to church, which is one of the expressions of being a Christian. I could be walking to any of three or four or five hundred thousand such places in America. I could be riding a, an elevator in a high-rise to a skyscraper chapel. I could be going down in a bus toward a storefront church. It could be as I started out in life in a little car down a country road to a rural church. The varieties are incredible. And the key word we Americans use for this is pluralism, diversity. Open the yellow pages of your phone book. Right there, alphabetically after chiropractors and just before cigars is a section called churches. And you will see a lot of variety there and we want to talk a little bit about how that variety came to be in North America. No two stories match in American religion. That picture I used of the yellow pages and the alphabet sounds all too safe. And then you see a church like this and it sends out signals. It says neighborhood, it says middle class, it says domestic, it probably says white. That's not the situation of most Christians in the world. Most Christians are in Africa, in Asia, everywhere but these safe little places. Well, the people who make up churches like this weren't always safe either. Many of them came as refugees. In this particular instance, many of them came to improve themselves from Czech and Slovak and other Middle European places and found their home. Today, I suppose they're looked at as being people in power. In other words, victimizers in a nation where much of our pluralism has meant victims. There are a lot of people who are on the underside of the Christian story in America, and they deserve our attention. Those who were here when the Christians from Europe came, the Native Americans, those who keep coming from the South in particular, the Hispanic, Latino, Latina Americans, and the African Americans who were here before the Mayflower. If you are a Native American, you may or may not be a Christian, Many Native American stories go back before Europeans brought Christianity here. Many Europeans came claiming that they wanted to convert Native Americans whom they called the Indians. And some of them genuinely did and there are good stories of rather noble action on the part of some. Some came with the conquistadores and tried to enslave you. Some of the chaplains among them, priests and missionaries and brothers did what they could to keep you from being enslaved. Yes, there is that good part of the story, but the diseases that were brought and the guns that were brought and the broken treaties that were made, all these warred against any notion that Christianity would be an easy package for you to accept. And yet, across the nation, on reservation and off, 
great numbers of Native Americans carry on the story of Jesus in their own version. Or suppose you are Hispanic. You may be from Mexico or Central America, South America, the Caribbean, wherever, and you've made your way here. You were here again before the rest of Europe came. Your frontier was New Mexico. There's a church and a house in Santa Fe that's older than the Mayflower. Mayflower being the place where many American Christians think the story in this hemisphere begins. You're there and again had been a suffering people and still very often suffer stigma at the hands of others. But you made your way and now in the northern cities they're a common presence and have brought along pictures of Jesus and of saints. Many of you were Catholic and stayed so. Others of you have become Pentecostal and Evangelical and Southern Baptist. Whatever the mix, you still share the common story of Jesus at the start of the church in the great variety we call American pluralism. And the third other set of people, you who are African American, if I talk to you directly, represent the pulse of American cities these days. If I am in many sections of my own city of Chicago, if I want to see a church that attracts thousands and does works of love and mercy, it's likely to be an African American church. And then I have to know that your roots go back a year before the Mayflower when the ship came to Virginia bringing Africans. People did everything they could to deprive Africans of the religions they brought and they were very slow to bring them Jesus. But in the course of time, African Americans began to find chapels of their own on the plantations or in the free churches. And when slavery ended, there was a great boom in the development of the black church as the strongest of all the African American institutions which it has remained. It's a story of triumph against all odds. It's a story of people who very often identify with the Old Testament, with Moses, with crossing the Jordan, coming to a promised land, but even more, identifying with Jesus and the call for justice and mercy against many difficult circumstances. Now, if I say that the Puritan story is your story, I could picture some grumbling, some protests, even some howls from different sets of people because the Puritan story is one that the Puritans themselves liked too much and the non-Puritans liked not at all. Let's take the non-Puritans first of all. They never quite liked it that so many of the stories in American history books and textbooks made it seem as if Puritans were the only people who made up America, the only ones that really belonged here. Not at all, say the others. You Puritans were far too legalistic, too crabby, too sure of the fact that you knew what God wanted of you along the way. We don't want to be any part of it. In that image, the Puritans were people who didn't want anybody to have a good time. They were people who forced you to go to church and listen to long sermons, who expelled you if you had an illegitimate child, or put a big A on you if you committed adultery or whatever. We don't like you Puritans. And so such Americans, including American Christians, don't like to see American history as Puritanism writ large. That sounds a lot like dead white European language to many races and groups in America today. And on the other hand, there are a lot of people of Puritan descent who aren't sure they like to share all the features of what went with that. But the Puritans were, in general, a rather highly educated group that came to Plymouth Colony on the Mayflower or came to Massachusetts Bay educated at Cambridge and elsewhere, sure of themselves, sure that they had a covenant with God, that this covenant meant that they had been knit together as a tight commonwealth and community. If somebody else came, they put them out. There were no Catholic churches in New England at all. They didn't like it when some people among them started turning Baptist along the way. So if the Puritans create such opposite images, why say they're part of your story no matter what? Well, they had a lot to do with the way the Bible was taught in America, the way biblical language became a part of American life, the way the textbooks were written. Maybe most of all in what is often called the Puritan ethic or the Protestant work ethic. Experts can argue a good deal about just what hand the Puritans had in it, but the Puritans certainly did believe that you were obliged to serve God if you're a special people by working very hard and long and honestly and saving and having high incentives. As you listen to that language, you can see how much that's part of the story of Americans today who aren't Puritan or Protestant or Christian.
the newest people coming from Southeast Asia, as well as anyone else who wants to make it in America, somehow seems to adopt some features of that ethic. What's your story? If I asked you that, and you wanted to answer in a Christian context, and you'd say, my story is that of the Enlightenment, or an I'm enlightened Christian, I'd probably faint or smile or scratch my head. I've never met anyone who would say that they are, in that sense, a product of the Enlightenment and Christianity. And yet, I think I can make the case on this one as well as anything else, that to know you, if you are a long time, at least in the United States, and a Christian, you brought together two faiths that are somewhat different from each other. What did I mean by enlightenment? I didn't invent the word. One historian said that late in the 18th century, in Western Europe and in North America, people invented a new religion that starts with a capital E, the big E, enlightenment. Aufklärung, the Germans called it. All of a sudden, the darkness and the shackles were to be off human minds, and they were to see in a fresh way. They wouldn't live by priestcraft and superstition. They wouldn't have to have a divine revelation other than the one they would find in nature. In America, it was a very small movement and a very mild version of it, but most of the people who signed the Constitution or signed the Declaration of Independence were people influenced by both their Protestant Christian faith and by the Enlightenment of that century. God was accessible through nature, through reason, through natural law. They're respectful of Christianity, respectful of Jesus. Thomas Jefferson in the White House pasted together clippings in French, English, the original Greek, and Latin of the Gospels with all the miracles taken out and called it the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth. They wanted a constitutional republic in which people would live respectfully of God's ways, but they weren't sure that you had to be formally Christian to be that. So they kept on being Congregationalists and Episcopalians, but their God was the God of reason, and they very seldom used biblical language to define it. What were they after? They were after producing a constitution with religious freedom, in which you were free to be religious or not, in which church establishment would no longer matter, in which you would have direct access to the open market of religion, as it were. So they ended up with a godless constitution and helped produce a nation in which Christianity had a much better chance than it did when it was still in the heritage of Constantine the Great, established by law, enforced by the magistrate. You're on your own, and as the West was ready to open, you could enter that West, and you could convert people on your own and start churches, and thus that too is part of your story if you are a Christian in the United States. What's your story? Some of you may have felt cheated by not having been mentioned or having your ancestors mentioned. That would be the case, for example, if you're from the southern colonies, Virginia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia. All these are interesting stories, and they too had established churches like New England. Nine of the 13 colonies had churches established by law, which meant that you paid taxes whether you believed or not. The long shadow of Constantine was still here in America. But in the middle colonies, and particularly, let's take the example of New York, it was a different story. They too wanted establishment, one church to rule, the governor determining the religion, and he was Dutch, reformed. But he couldn't have his way because in 1654, he watched a ship come into the harbor, and he learned that there were Jews on it, a ship from Brazil. What will we do? What would we do if we take in Jews? Then we're going to have to take in Catholics and Lutherans and Mennonists and all kinds of other people who aren't Dutch reformed. But the Dutch West Indies Company told him, you'll take Jews, you'll take them all. We're a trading colony and you can't have those barriers. You can't have that knit and tight community that Winthrop wanted up in New England. And so in many ways, New York and with it, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, colonies like that were way ahead in the story of American pluralism. If they're Christian and the majority remain Christian, it meant that they had that single story of Jesus, but they had it in very different patterns, including patterns of church and state. But now a new element came in after the Constitution, and the new nation was born. An element that got started earlier. This is your story if you're an American. You are an heir of what we today would call the awakening, revivals, conversions, and so on, the heating up of religion.
Again, you might be a Jew tuning in, listening in, and wondering how you could be a part of it. What I mean by this is that a set of people came who were not interested in establishment and who learned that if there is to be a story for Christians, a Christian story, somebody had to tell it, and somebody had to tell it rather aggressively. If you had a minister of the establishment in your town, he could drone out the same old sermons for 60 years, but one day somebody would ride into town and say, are you sure you're saved? Are you sure your minister is saved? You have to have an experience of Jesus. Today, people call it, you're born again. Today's evangelicalism, a la Billy Graham, was really born of that mood that got started all over the colonies in the 1730s and 1740s. But the high drama came when the West opened, when the mountains opened. Now you had Methodists, an English group that had come and prospered after the war. You had Baptists who could start churches just anywhere as soon as there were three or four people and they could ordain a minister. This is what we would call the winning of the West. And you have a kind of an East versus West religion for a while. Many people in the East extended their story by building colleges in the Midwest. Many of the finest colleges today were started by the heirs of the revivals. One little log college near Philadelphia used to have a sign out there that 58 American colleges sprung from that one alone. But by and large, the West was not tamed by Eastern styles. There was a new rough and readiness to the Methodists, the Baptists, the Disciples of Christ, and others. But if you think East and West was a complex story, it got even worse in North versus South because you had the issue of slavery, you had then had the issue of secession. And from 1861 to 1865, Presbyterian Christian fought Presbyterian Christian. Baptist of the South fought Baptist of the North. Congregationalists, Episcopalians were mainly in the North, but they too were on both sides of the issue in a way. A bloody conflict that has marked American life ever since. In the midst of it stood Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, who was never a member of the church, the only president who was never a member of the church, but he was a rather regular church goer in Washington. And he read widely, and he adopted many of the biblical themes and sounded more Christian than a lot of the Christians when he talked about reconciliation after the war. And so the North story and the South story is your story no matter where you live. But there's another story alongside the awakening and heating up of religion with the born again, and alongside the regional difference of East and West and North and South that still shapes America today, and that's for shorthand reasons, to be called the immigrant story. Now, everyone, every Christian in America is an immigrant. Maybe an immigrant with the Native Americans many years ago, across the Bering Strait, but everybody else came by boat or later by plane and now by foot. Franklin Delano Roosevelt once insulted the daughters of the American Revolution by saying, fellow immigrants, because they all were immigrants. But the later comers were called immigrants. And they came in great numbers after the Irish potato famines. Catholics came from Ireland in the mid-19th century. Jews after pogroms in Eastern Europe after 1881. But many other groups of people, mainly from the continent. Western Europe bothered nobody. But when Southern Europeans came, Italians, when Eastern Europeans came, Russians, no one knew quite what to make of them at first. They tried to put barriers down and many of the people who wanted the barriers were themselves Christians of a certain type who worried that everybody else would diffuse or change or corrupt their story. Well, we don't want to make this a simple success story. It wasn't easy for the immigrants, but by and large they stayed. American pluralism became enriched and has stayed so. I have two little codas to this story that have to be a part of it yet. And one is the story of enterprise. Americans like to talk about free enterprise or enterprise. They enterprise in religion, too. And numbers of new religions, spin-offs from historical Christianity, developed. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, forming in the 1830s in New York and moving out toward Utah. Christian science, which wasn't regarded as Orthodox Christian by anybody else, but has the word Christian in the title. Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, they all enriched this American mix, and most of them did so again by reference to that story of Jesus. And then through it all, there's been a note, I'm gonna call it the prophetic, 
because it remembers the prophets of ancient Israel. It remembers John the Baptist and Jesus. It remembers all the people through the ages who have been restless. The kingdom is not here yet, and we must advance it. We must bring it. They were discontented with the way the society was put together. They started reform movements, voluntary associations, Sunday school unions, temperance unions. Some of them were abolitionists and fought for the freedom of the slaves. Others for social reform in the suburbs. That's your story, too, if you're in Christian America. And while most of these prophets would have unsettled your ancestors, even as they unsettle us now, soon we take them into our heart and say they're part of our story. Most recently, people like Martin Luther King, who on the one hand had the Declaration and the Constitution and their religion in his pocket and said, you assured us rights, now we want them. And in his other pocket, he had Isaiah and the Gospels and wanted justice and righteousness to roll down and peace of Jesus to come upon the nation. That's part of the story, too. So the American story picks up from the Christian story as it had developed until the 16th century and right down into the present. It's enriching that story, a story of which you are a part, a story that shapes you. story. If you're a modern person, believer or not, Christian or not, my hunch is that it's a story in which doubt and faith come into conflict. If you don't believe, you probably have doubt so strong that faith would be very hard to acquire. If you're a person of faith, you may have fortified yourself so much that doubt never enters, but the vast majority of people have some admixture of doubt with their faith and some conflict between the two. Now, doubt is not an invention of the modern world. When I enter the building in which I taught for 35 years at the University of Chicago, I pass a statue, a profile of the disciple Doubting Thomas, reaching into the side of Jesus and touching a wound and saying, now I believe because I've seen. And Jesus says, yes, you believe because you've seen. From now on, you have to believe without seeing, and then you are blessed. A lot happened since then, and in the modern world, uh, the Thomases get to be almost prevalent. And if you want a modern corporation, a modern government, a modern society, a modern place of learning, odds are that these two worlds are going to come together in rather abrasive ways because some of the modern inventions elevate doubt. And maybe they had to if we want to learn. Uh, so I'm going to take an example walking a little further down the hall at my university, Chicago, we could be doing it at Harvard or Yale or Princeton or Vanderbilt or any number of the private universities, all of them founded with a Christian vision, all of them founded in the modern period when you have to bring together that vision of faith and of doubt. So let's stop for a moment at the founder of this one, William Rainey Harper, a genius, a person who was successful to get money out of John D. Rockefeller, the oil man, and the two of them together put a package together out of a little Baptist school that became the modern University of Chicago. A little over 100 years ago, so it's well on into the period of what we would call modernity. Harper was a man of faith. He had come from Yale. He was a professor of the Old Testament, as it was then called, the Hebrew Scriptures, a dynamite teacher who, while president, got 3,000 people to sign up for a correspondence course to learn the Hebrew language. Harper had such confidence that if you learned the languages of the Bible and you put a modern interpretation on it, you could build a better democracy, a better society, a better university. But if he wanted a university, he had to take in something else and did gladly. He brought in a skeptic, a doubter, like the philosopher John Dewey. He brought in the Rabbi Hirsch, to prove that you didn't have to be Christian to have learning. He brought in all of these kinds of people, and from day one, that's the case. So that at these universities today, the fact that you're a believer is no point in your favor, and I suppose at some places, believers have the feeling they're pushing uphill all the time against mountains of doubt. How did that come about in the modern world? I suppose the time to do would be early modernity. Let's take a look at it for a moment. The Christian University of the Middle Ages, Oxford, 
Paris, Bologna, back to them, were founded on an idea that was capsuled by a man named Anselm. I believe in order that I may understand. If I have Christian faith, I will get a vision that will help me do better at the other worlds of learning. Modern universities were born of a different vision. Here, just to take one symbol, I'm going to take uh, René Descartes, a uh, Frenchman philosopher who died in 1620. He remained a Catholic, but he brought something new into the field of learning. What was that new thing? He crawled into a stove alcove and said, if I want to learn, I must doubt everything. He doubted and he doubted and he stripped away all kinds of things, including sense experience to doubt, until finally he had nothing left but his own act of thinking. And so he finally said, I think, therefore I am. Cogito ergo sum. The other side of that is, I have to be suspicious of everything else. Without that, we wouldn't have modern medicine. We wouldn't have modern learning. We wouldn't have separation of church and state or any of the other features of modernity. The university is only one of the symbols of modernity. There are plenty of other places. But I think if you are struggling with the conflict between doubt and faith, a uh, college, a university, is a pretty good symbol of that arena around you, even if the main arena is on in your own mind and is part of your story. What's your story? If you're a modern person, believer or not, Christian or not, I have no doubt that your story is one of conflict, but conflict of a different character than we had in other ages. In other ages, their conflict might be between the emperor and the simple Christian, one that often ended up in a conflict between the lions and the Christians in the arena in the age of persecution. Or in the Middle Ages, it could be conflict between the emperor and the pope, and most people were bystanders. This was a conflict over power. In the time of the Reformation, there was conflict between the Catholics and the Protestants, and you kind of get used to those kinds of wars, but they're still family quarrels. But with the modern world, conflict moves somewhere else. It moves inside the head. It moves into the place where our habits get formed. And I'll give a sample. The first sample would be a conflict between sense experience and faith. That's new. In the Middle Ages, whatever your senses told you could be in no conflict with faith. You saw miracles happen. You saw the devil. You saw angels or thought you saw them. Nobody doubted that, that that could be the case. The miracles were not hard to take. And then in modernity, you begin to mistrust the senses. I used to tell my students here, what would you think of me as a historian, even if I taught the history of Christianity, which I did. Suppose I told you on a Friday, I want you to figure out an answer to a particular historical problem. And you use your senses, I'm going to trust you. You're going to have your eyes on a document. You're going to feel that document. You're going to sense how old it is. You're going to be suspicious of it. And then I come in on Monday morning and say, oh, I sent you on a wild chase. You, I have no documents at all. I didn't use any senses at all. Three o'clock this morning, an angel came and said, Marty, here is the answer. And I come in and tell you that, and you think I'm a historian, and you say, hmm, something went wrong. We have a nice psychiatric clinic on campus. Maybe we better send the professor down there to get him straightened up. Why? Because we take for granted that you are testing with the senses. And that was a challenge for faith. To take just a line or two about three great thinkers who brought this. John Locke, who remained a Christian, started saying you have to test the scripture and everything with your sense experience. You can know the historical Jesus, but you can't know a divine power behind that. Let's talk, he would say, about the reasonableness of Christianity. Another thinker, David Hume, went much further when he doubted the miracles, doubted all the supernatural. Why? Because there was a screen between us and it. And if you couldn't get into supernature in any other way, there couldn't be anything meaningful to say about supernature. And faith seemed to belong to supernature, so there went that. Or Immanuel Kant, a great German philosopher, who made a big distinction between the phenomena, the things that we can see and touch, and the what is behind it, the noumenal, the invisible, the transcendent, all those beyond kind of words that are hard to grasp if you're not a philosopher. But you can grasp the basic idea that you have nothing to talk about except with sense experience. 
So you're left talking not about Jesus, the divine figure, the eternal one who proceeds from the Father. You're stuck with, and happy to be stuck with, the historical Jesus because he left footprints, he left documents, and you can touch them. And so sense experience begins to win out over faith. If conflict is a big part of your story, and if it's in the mind and in the heart, then I have a second one that I have no doubt is live if you're a Christian. That's the conflict between rationalism or reason or skepticism on one hand and scripture on the other, divine revelation. Most Christians have believed that God chose to reveal God's self through the prophets, through Jesus, and then this is all witnessed to in books, the Old and New Testament, the Bible, the scripture, which was always set apart completely as a supernatural document. The Holy Spirit inspires it all, no matter how it is written by humans, and as such is protected from critical scrutiny. But once you've come along with the philosophies that I've just discussed, then you're going to treat the Bible quite possibly in a different way. If you say there's nothing we can say intelligently about the supernatural because it's not part of our sense experience because we can't test it, we can't get back there behind the phenomena, the things we touch, then how can you exempt it from studying it just the way you study any other literary documents? You take the Bible and say, we'll call it sacred because people call it that, but when we study it, we're going to take it apart just the way we take Homer, the Greek poets, Caesar, and the Roman writers apart. And we start finding different questions of authorship and different kinds of documents. For some people, that meant the Bible must be a phony document and they would lose faith. For many people, called higher critics, they thought this was a way in which they could rescue the faith in the modern world. If people weren't going to take the supernatural side, they would at least talk about the wonderful things that Jesus, the teacher, had done, for example. There still was plenty of morality in the Bible, moral teaching. Let's stress that along the way. There are other people who said, we can't make any compromise. We've got to hold the line completely. I spent six years of my life with a colleague and some other authors studying that kind of reaction. It usually gets called fundamentalism because the argument is, in all religions, but in this case in Protestant Christianity, that the fundamentals of the faith are declared in the Bible, and you can't give away one letter of that without the whole edifice crumbling. You must build everything up across the way. Forget about reason, forget about rationalism, forget about the issue of sense experience. Just take for granted that God would not fail us. God will be revealed in a reliable, distinctive document. Most people are not losers of faith because of the unreliability of scripture. Their faith hasn't been located in the historical accuracy of everything in it. And most people aren't fundamentalists. That is completely reactive. Most people, Catholic and Protestant, tend to be somewhere in between, which is a way of saying they want to learn all they can about the biblical documents, and yet they see it as authoritative, as the source and the standard and the measure of their faith. But still that conflict does live in the church bodies and in the minds of people of faith. So it's part of your story. And I have a third part to this story. And this time I'm going to call it the conflict between reason and feelings. Not feeling, but feelings. The uh, emotions, the passions, the enthusiasms of the heart. Some people had said that you could reason about everything in the faith. You could prove the existence of God. We were talking about Thomas Aquinas or anyone else, John Calvin, would use their mind and do everything they could to prove the truth of the faith. But some people came along and said, no matter how much you do that, it's not going to be faith. Faith is located somewhere else in the heart. One of the great formulae for this came from a Christian, a philosopher, a mathematician, as smart as anybody I've mentioned, Blaise Pascal who, while helping invent modern mathematics, also had a profound religious experience. And out of that, he came up with the line that the heart has its reasons that reason does not know. The heart has its reasons that reason does not know. That's behind a great deal of the impulse in the modern world to rescue the faith through feelings, 
the great awakenings and the revivals of the 18th century, John Wesley and the founding of Methodism, movements called Pietism, Renewal, all of them stressed the heart. John Wesley, again, as smart as anybody and very informed about Christian thought, said in the end it came down to the warmed heart. If your heart is in the right place with Jesus, then I will know that your life will follow and that you are a Christian. It's pretty hard to picture someone who is a Christian and parking his or her reason at the door. You want to make sense of things. Why is there evil in the world? Why do evil things happen to me? And it's very hard to picture anybody parking their feelings at the door because so much of what we have to do with faith has to do with how God speaks to us in our crises of life, in our malignancies, in our joys, in the birth of a child, in the celebrations, and so on. So the heart has its place. Alfred North Whitehead, a great philosopher, said that the moment when reason versus feelings came to be big in the faith is a very important moment in Christian history because until then almost everyone had assumed that reason and faith were not in conflict and that you could reason your way into faith. Thomas Aquinas would say you could prove it. No, no longer, Whitehead said, will people take up that trail and argue the faith. They're going to rely upon reason. And he said it wasn't a bad instinct. It appealed to the hearts and minds of the factory workers and the farmers, people who hoped out on the new frontiers of a place like America. They didn't need to be reasoning. They didn't cart big libraries over from Europe. They had to talk to God directly. And I think that that conflict, never going to be resolved in the mind of anyone or in the church at any age, can be a very creative one. And therefore, it remains a part of the Christian story. And if you're a Christian, it's part of your story. If I've had anything right about your story as being a story of conflict, as you live in the modern or the late modern or the postmodern world, I'm calling it modernity, then we'd have to look at some subtler features. Not always do the challenges come from people like David Hume and Immanuel Kant. It often comes through the adjustments that ordinary people with ordinary names make, and we're all a part of that story, and we feel those conflicts too. For some, the conflict is described by the words the secular versus the sacred. Secular comes from a Latin word that means of this age. In a sense, it means that we do our thinking without any reference to anything beyond our time and our place. Words like beyond disappear. Words like transcendent disappear. And all we're left with then is the joys and sorrows of our lives of sometimes quiet desperation, sometimes joys. The secular didn't always come about I say, because a philosopher defined it. The people defined it. The Industrial Revolution, for example, was an agent of this increase of secular styles and thinking. The Industrial Revolution occurred, in a sense, late in the 18th and early 19th century, when they began to harness steam and put the boilers on wheels and thus have rapid motion, the railroads. And soon, when machines could make machines in the large factories with the smokestacks and brick, and people who lived in little villages and farms moved to new places, huddled together in huge cities. Interestingly, in many parts of the world, the United States being among them, the Industrial Revolution did not mean a loss of faith, but it often meant a change in practices. And those practices really hit the churches hard, for example, in England and in Western Europe. One British novelist, H.G. Wells, coined the word everydayishness. Everydayishness meant that people now could ride the trains to the beaches on Sunday and they wouldn't go to church. Everydayishness meant they had to spend some time in their young labor movement and they wouldn't spend it in the church hall, they would spend it at the lodge hall or the union hall. They would make all of these kinds of adjustments and they wouldn't kill God, but they would begin to live in such a way that there was a conflict now between Sunday and the rest of the week in a different way. There's a conflict that reached into all parts of life. The growth of modern entertainment, modern media, and all of these. They don't have to be in the hands of people who want to kill off God, but they do bring about change. I often talk about America as a place where as many people as ever say they believe in God, nine out of 10, 
as many people as ever say they believe in Jesus, eight out of ten. But there's some decline in the participation in the communities of faith. And in no small measure, that's because of secular, practical, everyday-ish adjustments. The weekend has grown, and it doesn't pay to stick around for an hour of worship. And so worship means less. We move into high-rise apartments, and we put less energy into the institutions such as the church. Everyday-ishness plays its part. But I can't close this without giving some attention to the fact that there were some philosophers who did line up their guns against the faith, and I want to mention just a few. I give them a little code name. I like to call them the great bearded god killers of the late 19th and early 20th century. And let's just point to them, not try to do justice to all their thought, but remind ourselves what the historian meant when he talked about pitiless and persistent rivals of Christianity. One was Charles Darwin, who in the middle of the 19th century, though he was to be a candidate to be a minister himself, said, he, I put my beliefs in my drawer and I went off on my scientific researches and when I came back, the beliefs had shriveled. They meant nothing. What had come in their place was a belief in evolution, in natural selection. Many Christians adapted to it, but many others found it to be an assault on the Bible's account of the beginning or on human dignity as being made in the image of God. And so there still is conflict over evolution. Or a second of these bearded God killers was Karl Marx, mid 19th century inventor of communism, who believed that religion was the opiate kind of opium of the people. It lulled the peasants and the poor factory workers into the belief that at least in the life to come, things would be evened up, but you shouldn't try to change your status now. And it gave status to those already in power and who had money, and so you must kill off religion. That pitiless and persistent rival was greatly weakened in 1989 with the fall of the Iron Curtain, and there's not as much left to it as before, but the legacy is there. The third of the great bearded god killers has much less influence than Charles Darwin as an evolutionist or Karl Marx as an economic thinker, but in intellectual circles he played a part. Friedrich Nietzsche thought that Judaism and Christianity were slave religions, and he wanted to see the development of the superhuman, superman, or whatever. And to do that, you had to kill off all these illusions about God. And he said, in effect, I went out into the village square and joyfully announced the death of God, and now humans could be free. Many nihilistic philosophies of our own time, beliefs in nothing, have risen from people like Nietzsche. And the fourth of these is Sigmund Freud, into this century, a bearded god killer, who was really quite sure that if humans were to come to terms with their own inner life, their own psyche, their own libido, their own superego, he invented many of these terms, they had to fight against Moses and monotheism and Jesus, and they had to see the ways in which faith was an illusion. So in all these respects, we can say that these bearded god killers had strong impacts and many people lost the faith along the way. And yet here we are, one third of the world is Christian before these assaults and one third of the world is so after. And if Christians lose somewhere in a part of the world, they grow in another part of the world. And if they got beat back for a while on the reason front, they recovered on the emotions front or the heart front. For if the reason had its reasons, the heart had its reasons that reason did not know as we heard. So there have been revivals and awakenings. There have been inventions of new forms. Instead of preaching the opium of the people, the churches came along and tried to invent their own patterns of justice. The American Civil Rights Movement is a good illustration of all those reverends who are out there leading people. Mother Teresa and curing people. All these are ways of reaching for resources that had not been recognized before. So if you're in the Christian story, you have to know that uh, it has climaxes and anticlimaxes, ebbs and flows, defeats and victories, sometimes partial victories, always new resources on which to draw. And so long as there are so many people who are somehow devoted in faith to the story of Jesus and the story of Christianity through the ages, they will keep finding those new resources. And if you are part of that adventure and are yourself called Christian, you may very likely find some such resources on which to draw. And they will be part of the story, and you will be helping write the story 
of the future. What's your story? I have no doubt that if I ask you that about your personal life, you won't start by saying, I am a member of the human race, or I am a human being in general, or even I am an American. You're likely to tell me who your parents are and where you live and what your work is. In other words, you're gonna start very close to home. We all have that impulse and instinct to measure things most important if they're near us. Even if an airplane goes down a couple of miles north of the Canadian border, if you're a U.S. citizen, it somehow seems a little less your story than if it's a few miles on this side of that border. That may not be the prettiest image of the human race, but it's the case. If it's a matter of rescuing our own child or giving money to rescue somebody in India, you know what we're going to do. We try to get a global vision, and yet we always start close to home. So, as far as your Christian story is concerned, if I'd start by asking you about it, odds are you talk about your own personal life, your prayer life, your experience, things you've gone through, or whatever. And maybe you'd get as far as your local congregation or parish or some Christian movement of which you're a part. And then maybe a denomination. And finally, you do what you say in the creed. You believe that there's one holy Catholic, holy Christian church around the world. Well, when you to talk about what's become of the Christian story, we have to remember that larger perspective as well. And that larger perspective is a little hard to come by. Again, I think we in the United States and in North America tend to think we're, this is the homeland of Christianity and we send out missionaries from here and we send out development programs and we send out food and healing. It's not quite that way. If you get a global perspective, the larger image, you don't just measure things from your own church tower. Just take numbers, for example. Africa. In the last 24 hours, sub-Saharan, black Africa, has 16,000 more Christians than it did 24 hours ago. And in the northern world, our part of the world, Europe and America, there are probably 3,000 fewer along the way. So we better pay attention. 2,000 after Christ, there are believed to be about 343 million Christians in Africa. Hold on to that figure, because then you go to Latin America combining the Catholic Church that's been there for five centuries and the Evangelical Protestants and the mainline Protestants and the new movements, add them all up, you're going to have 470 million. Asia, we think of as Buddhist territory, communist territory, Hindu territory, but add up the Christians of the subcontinent and the rim of Asia, and you're going to get 301 million, according to the atlases and computers and census for the year 2000. Europe, tired old Europe with a lot of empty churches, 536 million. We don't count them quite as enthusiastically as the others. They have a lot to relearn if they want to be a part of global Christianity in new ways. But still, they are the parent of so much of the rest of it. Well, after all those 343s and 470s and 301s and 536s, where are we? North America, 220 million. Rather puny, way down the list. Very important, it's our home. But let's for a moment stretch and talk about how the Christian Church came to be a global phenomenon and not just what one great Catholic of the 1930s said when he said, Europe is the faith and the faith is Europe. Today the whole world is involved with the Christian story and we're a part of it. I move very rapidly in thinking of what stories are like from the most intimate to the global, from the idea of a family and a personal life to hundreds of millions of people in different continents. And that's quite a leap. And what we have to learn, if we want to see how these interact, is to find different perspectives, different ways of listening, different ways of looking. I spend my life doing this in several different ways. And I try to teach my students to think of looking at the Christian church the way they look at a hurricane, or the forces against the Christian church as the way they look at a storm, the hurricane. There are really four vantages. The one, when I use the hundreds of millions figure, is what happens when we go into a satellite image. When you see a hurricane coming, you see these silvery ribbons in the Caribbean. You're 30,000 miles away from them. That's pretty safe. 
you get closer. You get closer as you do in a C-130, where you have all the measuring instruments, but you move in the eye of the hurricane with the hurricane. You're pretty safe. We've never lost a C-130. More dangerous is the vision from right close on the ground. The bridge tender who sees to it the last people are leaving the island. Or the uh, physicians and nurses who can't leave the island. Or the people in the boats who would have to take them across. Or the police or the weather people. They can't leave, though they know all about it. That's a close-up and dangerous view, but an important one for getting the story. And then finally, for the 1.8 billion, it's uh, the vision of the people in the hut itself, each little hut, where you could put up the plywood and get out the sandbags and know the storm is coming. And you might be devastated by it, or you might get out of town. We may live on all those levels, and for the moment, I'm starting with that satellite vision. A very different picture when you talk of how the Christian church moves around the world. How did it get there? Today, with the slippage, if you will, into the southern hemisphere or into the poor world, I often like to picture the old paint advertisements. We cover the earth, and it showed a kind of a gravitational pull of the drops of paint from the northern to the southern world. That's part of what's happening on the C-130 or the satellite image of what's going on in America and in the world. How did it get there? In a little while, we'll do a little close-up of the missionaries. It got there really in two ways. It got there by conversion or the sword. A very distasteful part of the Christian story is when it got there by the sword. A king would be converted, he'd be baptized, and he made everybody else follow. Clovis of the Franks, today's French people, was baptized, and so all his people had to be. Olaf Tryggvason, a thousand years ago, the most feared Viking, was not out after gold, he was out after souls once he was converted. When he found the king who had killed his father, he forced an adder, a poison adder down the throat. He didn't kill the man, so they put a hot grill on him, and that killed him. And Olaf would take his sword and turn to the other tribe and say, now you have a choice, be baptized or be killed. Well, given those odds, you know what you would have chosen, I suppose. And that's what we call the conversion of the north. Through the years, though, the conversions that stuck were one at a time as people came to accept the story of Jesus and make it their own. You can't have the great global shift in the location of Christianity without a great deal of change. And we, in our kitchens and our local churches, are being changed all the time. And our stories grow by the fact of these great Christian changes around the world. What occasions the change? Well, if you've been in Africa and uh, you've been a nature worshiper, if you will, and then you are converted to Christ and you become a part of the church, you're very different than if you were a European where you got your Catholicism or your Protestantism mixed with Plato and Aristotle. I could go to church 10 years and not hear the words Plato and Aristotle, but if I've studied them, I know good and well that uh, a lot of the concepts we're using are colored by that. Even our attitudes toward the physical world around us. Somebody said you can't uh, have the physical side of the Christian faith unless you have a loaf of bread, a bottle of wine, and a river. But you can't have a bottle of wine everywhere except by importing it. And I remember meeting in 1960 of people of the churches around the world where an African bishop got up and said, would you help us through this problem? We know that we're supposed to use the fruit of the vine, but grapes don't grow in our country. And when we're at war, we can't import grape juice or wine but we have sweet potatoes, and they are a kind of a vine, and we can make a sweet potato brandy. Would that be all right? Do you think Jesus would have approved of that? And we laughed. We thought it was trivial, thought it was humorous. But it's very real if you are in that situation. And we're learning a good deal more about taking those situations seriously. You see it in our art. Nowadays, we know that if there's a painting of the Nativity or the Holy Family in Korea, Jesus is no longer going to look like a blonde European, the way the blonde Europeans painted him. He's going to look like a Korean. People paint Jesus with their own brush, and they interpret the faith in those terms. So it is with music. A hymn book in almost any church body in America today is going to include some hymns from South Africa, from Venezuela, from the Philippines, or whatever. And they become a part of our thinking without our hardly even knowing it till we sing them as readily as anything else along the way. So I think we all have to be ready for these great changes that come, and our stories will grow in the light of these 
experiences. When we get to the story of how Christianity came to move from Europe to the whole globe, we get into a lot of controversy. One of the great modern storytellers of Christianity called the 19th century the great century because it expanded into all the world through a burst of energy unseen before. I know plenty of people, historians, who tell the story of that as the ugly century, a bad time. Why? Because exploiters, colonial powers, went into all the world, and with their Christian missionaries along the way, they uh, disrupted nice old cultures, and they tried to convert people of no faith or of other faiths, and what business did they have to do that? We're outside the Divinity School of the University of Chicago, where, say, 70 years ago, classes were full of people who wanted to go into China, India, or wherever. Maybe not so much to convert anymore. They were Protestant liberals, and they didn't have that so much in mind. They went to start universities and colleges and elementary schools and high schools, where they went to start the hospitals and uh, staff them. But, but it was mission, very much it was mission. Today, at this kind of school, you would find instead that they study world religions, history of religions. They study the way cultures meet. And in that, very often, the missionaries are the bad guys and bad women. Why? Again, because there were other religions there, and now they crashed in upon them. You can see, therefore, that the Christian story sort of divides here, depending upon how you regard what's going on. But we'll never understand it unless we get to the huts, to the people that are converted saved, made a part of the church, and those bridge tenders and other people I talked about at hurricane time who know the story and are on the scene all the time. And then it turns out to be a good deal different. Suppose you'd ask one of them, why are you here? I can't picture many of them saying, because England has to take over India and I have to justify it, because they want to plant the flag there and I want to plant the cross there with the flag. Certainly that was part of what happened. But I think most of them would answer quite honestly, as anyone who reads their diaries could say, they went because they heard there was a great commission. Jesus had said to the disciples in one of the Gospels, go into all the world and preach the Gospel, baptizing people. And they thought if that was the command, they should do it. And Jesus had given the promise that he would be with them, and they, they did it, and that became their story. And so they went and they did it. They would say, we are doing it to save souls, to fill up heaven, to enlarge the number of people who will be there. And we're going to make their bodies more whole and their minds more alert. How can you fault us for that? One of the people, I think, who had a kind of an interesting view of this was Adley Stevenson, who had no special investment at all in Christian missions. But in the 1950s, he was the United Nations ambassador from the United States. And on a trip to Africa, he was taken around by some people in the new churches that spring up there, out to the old graveyard where the 19th century missionaries and their husbands or their wives and their children were buried. And he came back and he said, the thing that impressed me was the graves. Oh, the graves, all the graves. What struck him was that people would not have gone to such lengths of catching tropical diseases and so on if, in spite of condescension, in spite of uh, wrong interpretations, they had not loved the people that they were there with. And there are many records in their diaries and letters of that. So, yes, don't forget the story of misuse of power and of colonialism and of tromping on other people. But the story also has to say, let's get up close to the people who went for a variety of reasons, very often of Christian love. And then a lot of them came home, World War I, World War II, they were unwelcome. Nation after nation might have closed the door to them. Iron curtains fell and no more missionaries could go. China closed and the missionaries had to go home. And what happened? The church grew. Interestingly, the story of the Christian church grew after the missionaries went home. They told the stories of Jesus and they told these stories and they planted churches, often with some little success, and today there's quite a burst of what are called the indigenous churches, the churches that grow up on their own soil. If you really want a word to clear your throat, they're autochthonic churches. They are out of the dirt and the soil of a place itself. Africanity, African Christianity, Latin American Christianity.
I visited some of these churches in South Africa alone. The African Indigenous Church numbered at that time over 2,000 separate, shall we call them churches, sects, prophetic movements. A prophet would rise and get a vision, often Pentecostal, and gather a group, and soon they had the structure of another church. I said, it's nice to be here in the AIC, the African Independent Church. And they said, independent of what? We're the indigenous churches. We've grown up on our own. And they have their own flavor. And they want to be tied to the rest of the world. I remember one time when my wife and I were in South Africa, and I had preached in a little Methodist colored church. Very poor people. The minister would sing a line. A jazz pianist would play a line. And they would sing. They couldn't afford hymn books. And we were invited to a home after a while, a home with six sons that served us tea and cookies. And we were thanking them for that. I learned later that they'd eaten nothing but potatoes since Thursday of that week, and the minister had paid for the tea so they could have dignity. When they left, we felt we'd gotten so much from them. My wife and I said, now, uh, what can we do for you? You've done so much for us. Oh, do what you do all the time. Just pray for us every Sunday the way you're doing it now. And we both gulped because we weren't sure that we had them that much in mind. But every such trip gives us more reason to have them in mind, and we do. And when you see the church in South Africa or in India or in Latin America, where the new growth is present, you also see that uh, the mission doesn't just mean saving souls, doesn't mean just preaching, if I can use the word just in both cases, but it means taking care of the whole person. Many, many of these places, the distribution system for medicine, the education, the building of colleges and universities has been in the hands of the churches that are the great-great-granddaughters of these 19th century missionaries. If they weren't on the scene, more would die, more would be hungry, more would be unsheltered, more would be in ignorance. So the story of the Christian mission, if it is your own or if you want to make it your own and own up to it, is an ambiguous story of good motivation and bad, of weakness in Christ and power of the imperial powers. It's mixed that way, but to me it's also the story of people doing the works of justice and mercy and spreading good news and thus enlarging the Christian story in surprising places. Maybe I've sounded too sweet about the story of Christian expansion in the world, the great century, because the dark side of that was cutthroat competition. Christians who hardly recognized each other as sisters and brothers in Christ as they claimed to, but people that you wanted to beat out, you wanted to get there before the Catholics did, or the Catholics wanted to get there before the Baptists did, or whatever. Carving up a world where there are a couple billion people when this all started, and yet you wanted to be sure that you were the victor and the winner. And it almost appears, if you say that there are 25,000 separate denominations today, that they don't even share a common story at all though there is at the heart a common story. It's almost like little balls of mercury spreading all over the place. But that's not the end of the story. In fact, the story as I'm telling it and you're living it is not ending. The next phase of the story was the search for unity. Because the time came when the mission expansion and the cutthroat competition was self-defeating. A very famous story is told about the 1930s when the low caste in India led by a Dr. Ambedkar, showed signs of restlessness in their kind of Hinduism. They were tromped on by everybody. That's what it means to be low caste. And along came these Christians talking about the human dignity and justice and God's love and all that would follow. Bishop Azariah met this Dr. Ambedkar. And they talked about it and uh, how you could have this story of Jesus as your own. And in the end, the spokesperson for the low caste said, you know, in our misery, we're at least united. If we became Christian, we would then be divided. Well, those kinds of stories throughout the 20th century kept coming back to the old home bases in Europe and America. And they induced a lot of people to work into change. Beginning in 1910, at a famous missionary conference in Edinburgh, where they decided this has gone far enough, we have to find patterns of working close together. Whoever looks at the story of the last two centuries might think, that the 19th century was one of the centrifugal force out of a center into all the world, becoming global. And the 20th century is a time of centripetality, trying to find the center again, letting gravitational pull come toward the center of that story, because it shows up in people baptizing and recognizing each other's baptisms, 
trying more and more to commune at each other's altars, trying to blend their stories along the way. And then all of a sudden, from under the surface, we find a lot of old discontent still showing. Many of them are men versus women, rich world versus poor world, or rich anywhere in the world versus poor, or different races and different ethnic groups at great distance from each other, having a hard time getting their stories to blend. So I suppose you could look out in pessimism and you want me to cheer you up and say, be optimistic, and that's foolish. Both of those are foolish options. Be realistic, one would say, as you look at the story, and be full of hope. Realistic hope isn't a bad way to look at the turn into the new millennium and the charter. And if anyone looks at the Christian story with realistic hope, eyes wide open and eyes also on the horizon and on the future, it doesn't take long until you say of this Christian story, this Christian thing that begins with the biblical story of Jesus and carries on into our own time, it has a plot. And what's interesting about that plot is it's unfinished. And as individuals and as groups, you are in that plot. It is your story and you're adding to it. Mm -hmm.